going on, like, well, isn't this the Christ? Hey, don't doesn't Jerry Falwell and Oral Roberts and Jim Baker know who this is? No, no, these these religious people, they, they knew who he was, and they knew he needed to be killed. He was drawing followers away from him. I mean, you know, we can't have competition. And I want to point out that the people who sought to kill him were all the people that had degrees. These are the people that had letters. These are the people that, that were somebody in the society. Now, let's think about this for a minute, because when you take a look at the world today and the society in which we live, who's, who gave us the war in Iraq? Was it the truck drivers working for Yellow Freight? Oh, no, no. It was the politicians in Washington. And can you name one politician in Washington from George Bush down that doesn't have a degree from college? You know, mull that one over a little bit. You know, the people that are giving us all the fits and all the problems, let's let's take a look at our economy over here. You know, with our bubble economy... Alan Greenspan, does he have a degree? Isn't he a college man? Ben Bernanke, you know, the new head of the Federal Reserve. Did you think that he was an illiterate that came across the uh, Rio Grande River? How about our attorney general, you know? No, he's, he's, he might be a Mexican, but he didn't swim across the river and take his job there at the Justice Department. That old boy has got a degree. He's been to college. In fact, if you think about it, you know, all of our leaders are college graduates. You know, the people that uh, run the uh, the universities, the college professors, you know, the people that are teaching these people that have these degrees. It's the intelligentsia of our society that run this show, you know. It's not the plumbers, carpenters, and electricians out here that got effity, you know, and wanted to go to war in Iraq and, and, uh, and uh, Afghanistan. These aren't the people, you know, the carpenters, plumbers, and electricians. These aren't the people that gave us our bubbles in the economy or that run the stock market or the Securities and Exchange Commission or issuing all of these no-bid contracts for Halliburton and Kellogg, Brown, and Root and Bechtel Corporation. Hell, those of us down here that have blue collars and are out here fixing the pipes and putting the roofs on your houses, all of us are smart enough to know that you need at least three bids before you can get the lowest price and the best product with the best service. Who who came up with this no-bid program for issuing all of these contracts to these uh, contractors over in Iraq? Weren't those college people? And who was it that gave us this uh, this uh, Medicare program, you know, the... The, the new Medicare program that they, they want to give free drugs to all the senior citizens. Evidently, the, the, the elderly people, they need a lot of drugs. We need to drug all these people up. We want to give them free drugs. And so they, they don't negotiate with the pharmaceutical companies. They just pay full bore retail because the taxpayers are out here paying the bill. You know, just common sense would say that when you're going to buy something in quantity. Now, let's just take a look at an, at an example. Just take the Veterans Administration. See, when they go to buy penicillin, they go to some pharmaceutical company. Maybe they go to GlaxoSmithKline. They say, listen, we need to buy 15 tons of penicillin next year. What's your price? And GlaxoSmithKline says, well, we got to have, uh, you know, we got to have uh, $35 a pound, you know, for our penicillin, okay? And so then they go over to Pfizer and they say, hey, we want to buy 15 tons of penicillin next year for all of our veterans' hospitals nationwide. How much are you going to charge us for penicillin? Maybe, maybe Pfizer says, well, we'll charge you $30 a pound. Okay, then they, maybe they go to Merck and they say, hey, Merck, um, uh, how about this penicillin thing over here? Going to buy 15 tons of penicillin next year for delivery to all of our veterans' hospitals. What do you got? Maybe they say $25. Now, let's take a look at the quality issue over here. Maybe they come over here to to the Glaxo people and say, well, you bid 35 bucks, but uh, uh, what is it about your penicillin that's better than Pfizer and Merck? You know, after all, you're charging 35 bucks a pound for it, so what's the... 
what's the story? And they may say, well, ours uh, has more uh, bacteria in it. My, ours got more of this or that or something else in it. You know, we, we turn out a better penicillin. It only takes half as much, you know, to cure a pneumonia. So, therefore, it's really a better value than that $25 stuff you're getting from Merck. So, it used to be, and I'm an old-timey general contractor, and I'm just here to tell you, you know, that just because you want a linoleum floor doesn't mean that you're you're getting the best quality at the cheapest price. You know, there's different qualities of vinyl, you know, different qualities of of workmanship that we can put in on this job over here, you know. But it used to be, when, uh, at least from my experience, that... Uh, that uh, when we wanted to buy something like, especially, you know, 15 tons, you know, you know, that's a lot of penicillin. You know, it's a little different when you walk into the doctor's office and you say, hey, listen, I'd like to get a shot of penicillin. The doctor says, well, that's $35 for one shot, S-H-O-T, one shot of penicillin is 35 bucks. Okay, that's one shot. But what if we were going to buy 100,000 shots? Wouldn't we get them for a little bit less than 35 bucks? Shouldn't we get them, you know, for 34.95 or 34.50 or something? Doesn't your common sense say that, you know, when you buy things in quantity, you get a little better price? Okay, now, here's Congress. They they came out and they made this Medicare deal over here and uh, they didn't negotiate a quantity discount for Medicare. They're just paying full bore retail. And the people that negotiated that were senators and representatives. You know, those were the people that enacted that in the Congress of the United States. Now, can you point to one congressman or one representative that hasn't been trained in college? Name one. And if there is one, would you send me a letter and tell me who that guy is or who that woman is that's that's actually gone to Congress and hasn't been to college, doesn't have any letters after his name. You know, I'm not too bright, and I'm a high school dropout, but I'm smart enough to know that if I was in the Congress, I would say, hey, wait a minute, guys, shouldn't we negotiate a a quantity discount here? I mean, after all, we're buying for about 50 million people here. It would seem like to me that if you were buying carrots, you know, from somebody and said, I'm going to buy 30 tons of carrots, that we would want some kind of a quantity discount. But somehow or another, all these smart people with the college degrees in the Congress and the President of the United States that signed it into law, they didn't think that a quantity discount was very important. Evidently, they didn't think that the amount of money that you and I as taxpayers was very important that we're sending off to Merck and Pfizer and GlaxoSmithKline. And that kind of ticks me off a little bit. All right, so there's one. Now, let me point out to you that Henry Ford, you know, he was a pretty smart guy. I mean, he built a pretty pretty good-sized company there, the Ford Motor Company. Did you know that Henry Ford only went to the sixth grade the sixth grade and there's really a funny little story that goes along with old henry in 1913 henry ford instituted a a project that he called the five dollar work day now you got to remember 1913 people were working for a dollar a day a dollar a day that was wages and Henry Ford came along. He couldn't keep people working, and he had this assembly line idea over there. He said, you know, I think I'll, I'll I'll develop my own workforce over here. And so he offered $5 a day. God awful hard work, but that $5 a day, you know, really made a lot of people mad because, you know, if you're a businessman and this guy's over here offering 5 bucks a day, you know, and he's a dummy on top of that. I mean, he never went to college and didn't get any letters after his name, you know. He wasn't a lettered man crummy sixth grade education he goes out here and he's hiring people at five bucks a day making cars faster and better than anybody else and cheaper than anybody else he created a lot of enemies in short order well somebody sued him over this i don't know exactly how this case came about but somebody sued him over this policy that he had over here and they charged that he was an incompetent he was a nitwit he was a jerk he didn't have any letters and that he couldn't run the Ford Motor Company, and that this thing needed to put it, be put into receivership, and that this thing needed to be operated, probably as creditors got after him, needed to be operated by paid professionals, somebody that knew somebody, you know, somebody that knew something, somebody with an MBA from the Harvard Business School or something like that. That's the way they run Ford today. They've got MBAs, you know, from the Harvard Business School or Yale or somebody that know something. 
And did you notice that all these people with all of these degrees that operate companies like WorldCom and Enron, you know, they run them into the ground and they go bankrupt. And then it costs millions and millions of stockholders a lot of money. And some of them, it costs them their entire life savings and things like that. Keeping in mind, again, that Ken Lay and the people running Enron are all college-trained people, you know, that come from the business schools. Those guys aren't plumbers, carpenters, and electricians and dummies down here putting tar on roofs, you know. Those people don't get their hands dirty. Now, I don't know why those of us with blue collars are running around worshiping all of these jerks because they can run their companies into the ground, because they can they can run them into bankruptcy and, and cost millions of people their life savings. And you think that these people are so damn smart that we ought to be following after them? Huh? I mean, hey, kids, have we, have we taken leave of our senses? And I'm just getting started here so far. I'm just scratching the surface. I'll get after them doctors and psychologists and psychiatrists and the rest of these screwballs out here as we progress along. I just wanted you to start thinking over here, hey, listen, if these guys are so damn smart, then how come they run these companies, these big multinational corporations, right into the ground? And you'll notice that when these guys leave office, you know, like Ken Lay, I mean, they leave with 50, 60, 100 million bucks in their jeans. I mean, they screw over all the little guys down here at the bottom, and all you little guys at the bottom buying those stocks to start with deserve what you got. You deserve to lose every damn dime because you're practicing unjust weights and balances, which you were strictly and clearly told not to do. You know, if we down here at the lower levels listened to our God for a change and said, hey, don't practice unjust weights and balances like we were instructed in Deuteronomy 25 and Leviticus 19, it never would have happened to us to start with. But since we invested our money in Enron and WorldCom and Global Crossing and the rest of these companies that go upside down, then, then these leaders, all of these people that are up here in the top management, you know, these people are all college people. They've, they've, they've got degrees after their names. And those of us that are buying the stocks and listening to these stock touts over here, telling us about what great inventions and great investments and how we're going to get rich and how we're going to retire on these investments, you know, when we get old and full of years. And then when the thing turns upside down, don't we learn anything from that? That, hey, we, we followed after a pack of fools. And these fools stripped us of our wealth. That's what the bottom line is. Well, anyway, old Henry Ford, you know, he's in court. And so the, the other side got up. I, I don't know if I was on direct. I guess it would, would be on cross-examination. Probably on cross-examination. I said, hey, Ford, you know, you dunderhead, you, you dumb screwball. This is the way they were painting him. They said, uh, now, Ford, how, how, how far in school did you go? And he said, oh, it's the sixth grade. Which, by the way, you know, in, in, in 1870, when he was going to school, sixth grade was, was a pretty good education. My granddad went to the sixth grade. And he was the mill superintendent at Northern Redwood Lumber Company and the Harold Castile Lumber Company. And he had, you know, I don't know, up at Northern Redwood, I'd say out in the yard, he probably had 100 employees working for him. And down at Harold Castile, my guess is that uh, it wasn't as big a company, but I'd guess 50, maybe 75. I know when my granddad died, there was 326 people went to the funeral. Biggest funeral I ever saw. Hell, I ain't sure that the mafia dons have 300 people go to those funerals. Presidents do, you know, and, and politicians. I, I'm not quite sure why. My, my old granddad only went to the sixth grade. He he could add and subtract. He could count real good too. I'm married to a woman that um, she went to school. She didn't she didn't get a college degree, but she counts real good and she she can read and write, which is pretty pretty darn good for just a girl, I'd say. Well, my granny, she went to the eighth grade and she told me that she she was pretty good at algebra and geometry in the eighth grade. She's a little better educated than my granddad. She didn't. She didn't have as good a job as he had, but then, you know, she's just a girl. Now, she went to the 8th grade. My granddad went to the 6th grade. Old Henry Ford went to the 6th grade. And old Henry over here, he's sitting on the witness stand, 
He told him he only went to the sixth grade, and they said, well, now, Mr. Ford, uh, when you have an engineering problem, what do you do? And when you have a, and when you have a, uh, 